the order of people going. Um, so It is. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. My brothers make fun of me and call it typewriter. <laughs> when I was younger, what was that? <laughs> now, I can't read what I wrote two, three uh... minutes later. Wait a second. I smashed it in my... Same as a can of Megan White or full screen. Yeah. Here we go. I'm glad Sean can join. I know. I know. He rounds out the conversation. Yep, that looks great. Yeah. We're having a lot of success in New York State, I have to say. I think he has a clicker, but... I have a clicker. If I feel more or less nervous doing this in front of a crowd again. <laughs> I like it. I, hello, yeah. everyone. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I don't think it's working. Oh. There we go. All right. Good morning. I hope you've all had a nice uh, opportunity to get some coffee and refuel in between sessions. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now on our Highways to Homes panel. Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of a brief introduction and primer to our panelists and what we're talking about today, and then I'll turn it over um, to them. But I'm Ben Crowther. I'm a program manager with the Congress for the New Urbanism's Highways to Boulevards Initiative. Um, the Highways to Boulevards Initiative, we've been around since 2006, and we work with communities across the country that are seeking to remove aging highways and in their place build uh, complete neighborhoods that support socially and economically stable communities. So these are our panelists today. We have uh, four great freeway fighters, uh, three of them in front of you. Uh, Sean Dunwoody is joining us uh, remotely. So we have Amy Stelly of the Claiborne Avenue Alliance in New Orleans. Uh, we have Sean Dunwoody with Hinge Neighbors Incorporated in Rochester, New York. Uh, we have Reagan Patterson uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And we have Mark Wooters with Mark Wooters Studios uh, based in New York City. So today we're going to, as a panel, I think, advance the premise that highway building is a housing crisis. And we're going to ask the question, can dismantling highways help alleviate that crisis and repair the communities that they split? Uh, but before we get there, though, we just want to provide a brief outline, a brief history of highway building and its inequitable effects on housing, particularly for black and brown Americans. So 1956, President Eisenhower signs into law the Federal Aid Highway Act, which funds interstate construction across all 50 states, uh, with the federal government picking up about 90% of construction costs. And this kicks off what the FHWA will unironically call the greatest decade. It's widespread highway construction, largest public works project in the history of humankind. The result, we now have 47,000 miles of federal interstate. So if you want to build a highway in the countryside, there's likely some land available like that slide we just saw previously. But what happens if you want to build one in a city? 
to let suburban commuters uh, easily get to and from work? What path do you take? Where do you build this highway? Here we have six American cities, all before the highway era. They're filled with homes, businesses, places to gather, places to worship, parks, public spaces, all the things that make our cities great. Uh, and to build a highway in a city, some of that has to be destroyed. So flip back to, uh, appreciate's the wrong word, but take a moment to consider the implications here. Um, at its peak, federal highway construction demolishes 37,000 homes a year to make way for roads. And that's how we get to over one million Americans, a significant portion of them black and brown, displaced from their neighborhoods. And now we have millions more who are left living next to a highway, subject to its nogics effects. So highway building is a housing crisis. And here's a sense of scale of what you have to destroy in the physical environment to build a highway. On the right, a highway interchange in Atlanta. On the left, the urban, historic urban core of Florence, Italy. And these two images are at the same scale. So you're gonna have to bulldoze the majority of downtown Florence to build that one interchange. And that's what we've done in our cities here. So if we come closer to the ground, we see the scars that highways can cause. Uh, this aerial photo from the mid-1970s gives you a sense of scale of how much of a city needs to be cleared for highways. In this case, it's the uh, actually never built right-of-way for the Park West Freeway in Milwaukee. And in total, Milwaukee uh, lost around 17,000 homes and 1,000 businesses to highway construction. So if you replicate that process in just about every city across America and multiply that over the decades we've been building highways, that's how you get to that number of one million people displaced. That's the human cost. So people forced to move from their homes, businesses and livelihoods upended, communities unraveled. Black and brown Americans disproportionately experience this upheaval. Highway builders have often targeted their neighborhoods, sometimes for very overtly racist reasons. And other times, they're simply following the path of least resistance from both a financial and political perspective. It's cheaper to acquire land and redline black and brown neighborhoods. And historically, these communities have lacked champions in positions of power uh, who will contest highway plans. So in a place like Milwaukee, this translates to into nearly half of those 17,000 homes that are destroyed coming from the predominantly black neighborhood of Bronzeville. And it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that our highway projects today have evolved and are no longer causing damage to our cities and our residents. Here on the screen, we have a rendering of an expanded I-94 in Milwaukee, a project that uh, WISTA is trying to push forward right now. You know, take a moment and think, what sorts of values uh, and priorities does this image embody? Uh, you know, we can look at it and say, you know, there's three things that stand out, the downtown, the stadium, and the highway. And those are literally, the, these are the only things that are rendered in three dimensions here, given any value. The homes around the highway, they're literally flattened in this image. So we need a new paradigm for uh, how we build and connect our cities, ones that centers people before highways. And that's what each of these different grassroots groups that you see their logos on the screen here stand for. They're just a smaller sample of a renewed freeway fighting movement that's calling to end new road building and even dismantle some of the existing roads, highways, in order to reconnect communities. And our panel today is gonna focus on that second category reconnecting communities by dismantling highways. Why is it imperative? What are the benefits, the potential pitfalls, the challenges? How can these projects foster community development and be truly reparative for the people displaced or impacted by highway building? We're gonna look at a handful of reconnecting communities projects today and their implications uh, for housing advocacy. Rochester, New York illustrates lessons learned from a recently completed Highways to Boulevards projects and makes tangible some of the benefits. In 2017, the city filled in the eastern part of its inner loop. 
The city's replaced that highway with Union Street and has been able to reclaim six and a half acres of land from the right of way, uh, which has started to develop and has been able to build out more than 500 housing units, more than half of them subsidized or below market rate. So that, uh, those green fields on the, uh, the screen you see there are the former path of the highway. Uh, most of that's actually built out in Rochester now. And so the end result is you have something, instead of a highway, you have something like this. Um, the city's now pursuing the removal of the northern part of the inner loop. And we're going to hear from Sean Dunwoody uh, about Hinge Neighbor Incorporated efforts to expand the diversity of housing types that gets built during this second phase. In New Orleans, Amy Stelly from the Claiborne Avenue Alliance is going to tell us why building new homes next to highways is not a solution for, to any housing crisis. And how once the highway is gone, uh, New housing needs to be properly integrated into an existing neighborhood if it's going to serve current residents. And we'll travel to the West Coast as Reagan Patterson walks us through the long-term environmental and demographic changes associated with the 1991 relocation of Interstate 880 around West Oakland and the subsequent creation of uh, the Mandela Parkway here uh, in its place. She's going to stress the importance of building a community vision for these projects and having a plan for dealing with unintended consequences like the displacement through gentrification of long-term residents. And Syracuse, New York can apply these lessons right now. Um, the state's uh, on the precipice of removing Interstate 81 through the city, uh, and this corridor is home to many Syracuse Housing Authority residents. And from this and uh, other examples in New York, particularly the uh, the uh, Brooklyn Queens Expressway in New York City. Mark Wooters will discuss how when a highway is removed, certain controls over housing uh, can keep low-income residents in their home and even increase their access to quality, affordable housing in connected neighborhoods. So I just want to end my part today with this image. It's a little grainy, I know, uh, but I think it shows the raw potential of reconnecting communities projects. If you peel back a highway, you get all of this land uh, returned to local control. What could a city do with it? It would build much needed housing, a new bus rapid transit line, a linear park, all of the above. Uh, could it be a reparative project that gives something back to the people who are displaced and prioritizes a corridor's current residents who now live with the highway? It takes a ton of political will to undertake this sort of project, but it's an opportunity to leave behind an enduring legacy for a city and its residents. Uh, so that's it for me. Each of our panelists is going to give a little short introduction to their work, um, and then we'll talk collectively uh, about the opportunities and challenges of transforming highways into homes, and of course we've saved some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Amy Stelly of the Claiborne Avenue Alliance. Thanks, Ben. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Can we switch to the next PowerPoint? Okay. Thank you. So urban highways and housing don't mix at all. Okay, thank you. So um, I live in the Claiborne Corridor, and as you can see, oh, I don't see, think the pointer is working, but the Claiborne Corridor spans the entire breadth of the city, and. I-10, our culprit, uh, takes up actually a small part of it, but the center of it. So it essentially cripples the city, because if you think of Claiborne as the spine of New Orleans, that part of the spine is injured, so the whole body is injured. Next slide. So here's a red line map of New Orleans from 1930. Um, and you can see the encircled area is actually where the Claiborne Expressway is. It went right 
through the red line community. And our colleagues, particularly in the CNU, are studying this and finding that by and large, these urban highways were built through communities that were redlined. A lot of New Orleans were red, was redlined back then, including the French Quarter, which also made it a candidate for having an urban highway, but the residents in the French Quarter had more agency, so they were able to defeat the Robert Moses plan. <clears throat> the I-10 through Claiborne was part of the national effort to build a highway across America. So it was a little bit separate. The city had, was already going to do it. And the Claiborne Expressway was actually planned before the Moses Project on the riverfront. Next slide. So the highway obliterated housing. And one of the most heartbreaking things is that it took away the housing of Homer Plessy, a civil rights icon who was, um, in Plessy versus Ferguson, he challenged separate but equal and got arrested, he lost. And Jim Crow reigned over Louisiana in the South as a result of Plessy losing the case. But the area that circled is his house on Claiborne. So his block is now nothing but a highway ramp and then the highway, the elevated deck next to it. So we lost housing, but we also lost landmarks and historic sites. Next slide. So this is what happens when you build highway next to an interstate. <clears throat> this is an implosion of housing that was meant to house medical students in the central business district, which contains the hospital district. It has charity hospital, former charity hospital, uh, Tulane's Medical School, LSU's Medical School. It's a really big medical complex. So the housing was built, but it never worked because nobody wants to live near a highway. Eventually, that housing became a seedy hotel, like really seedy, fights in the hallway, people screaming. And finally, it was just imploded because it, it never did work. It couldn't work as a residence. It couldn't work as a hotel. Next slide. So why is that? Next. One reason is there's a lot of particulate matter that comes from the emissions with highways. So it's a really toxic environment. Next slide. This is a picture of my house. So I have, uh, I'm in a legacy residence, so I want to keep my house. My family has owned the house in the Cleveland Corridor for over 68 years now. So we want to keep that real estate, and it's a beautiful piece of real estate. But the particulate matter is particularly treacherous. It sticks to your house. You can't hose it down. You have to pressure wash it down. So imagine what it's doing to your lungs. Next, poor air quality. Nobody wants to live in an environment with poor air quality. And a neighbor of mine who used to live in the corridor, she has since moved out, sent me this screenshot one time on the left of the unhealthy environment. And she was pregnant at the time and really kind of losing her marbles over having to bring a baby into this kind of environment. Next slide. Noise pollution. I can tell you it is horrible. So I have worked with LSU School of Public Health and we have measured the amount of noise right under the highway. I live a block and a half from the elevated deck. It is at dangerously high levels under the expressway, and that is not during rush hour, that is just normal, it's almost deafening. Next, flooding. There is a video that goes with this. If you go to the Claiborne Avenue Alliance website, you can actually see the video. The city hasn't maintained the highway, neither has the state or the federal government, so it rains through the deck and exacerbates flooding in the neighborhood. So that's hot, dirty water that comes off of the deck into the neighborhood. Nobody wants to live around that. Next slide. Dumping. I have documented this site over and over and over again. This is a half block from my house. And I have to tell you quite honestly, I'm sick of the boat <laughs> that was moved from a vacant lot to right near the ramp. And to make matters worse, the city is storing um, road repair materials next to it, and they won't even move the dumping. 
they just move in with it. Next, opioids. Um, the slide on your right is also in a video. It's on the warnings page on the Claiborne Avenue Alliance website. But the slide on the left was really um, a, a particularly heartbreaking experience for me. So this is a woman who had just received her supply of drugs from the drug dealer who drives up next to the ramp where the boat was. And I don't know what he gave her, but she was in the street. So I had to coax her out of the street so that she wouldn't get hit. I couldn't even drive past her. She was so out of her mind that when I tried to help her, she went from one part of the right of way into another, and I tried to get her out of the street, and she politely said to me, F you! So I left her alone, but I watched until she made it um, to the sidewalk. But this is something that we contend with regularly, including overdoses. So there are times when children who are walking to school meet the coroner under the ramp because he's got to remove someone who has overdosed. Next slide. Prostitution. All of these slides, well, with the exception of the one on your right, that was taken about three blocks from my house, but the one on your left was taken from my balcony because I live on the highway for prostitution, which is my street. And then the one in the middle is um, actually a picture. It reminds me of a, a, an Impressionist painting, but there was glass, I mean, water on the windshield. And this particular prostitute propositioned my husband, who was in the car. So <laughs> you have to deal with all kinds of unwanted activity when you live in this kind of environment. Next slide. Gun violence. This has become a thing in New Orleans. So the slide on your left um, just kind of recorded something that has become, unfortunately, a regular occurrence in the Claiborne Corridor. But now it's gotten worse. As you can see, 32 people shot on the interstate in 12 months. So this is a thing. Parents driving off the ramps have lost their children because the children have been shot in the back seat and the parents, unfortunately, have had to drive their children to a place where they could safely get out, call the police, and tend to them. So this is a really, really serious occurrence in New Orleans, and it's not only happening in the Claiborne Corridor now, it's also happening in New Orleans East, in the eastern part of I-10. Next. So the question is, would you live here? Or would you want anybody to live here? So those of us who live in the corridor have no choice. I mean, I guess I have choices. I could sell my real estate and then move somewhere else. I could not buy the house that I have in New Orleans anywhere I couldn't afford to. Um, but then there are people who have to live in the, in the corridor because facing the highway is affordable housing. And truthfully, with short-term rentals, it's no longer even affordable to live against the highway. But guess who they're putting there? Visitors. So it's not good for visitors either because would you want to be in a short-term rental that's up against the highway? Next slide. So these slides, with the exception of the one on the left, this one is on Claiborne Avenue with the blue house, but the seventh ward is really the untold story of how much devastation a highway can do. So if you look at the top slide on the size of the columns, that's one column supporting the highway that is just tore through the seventh ward. And on Ben's um, slide where he introduced me, there was a perspective in one of, the ish one of the slides. That is a picture of I-10 going through the seventh ward. It just cut a swath through the neighborhood. Next slide. And then we have the unhoused who are most vulnerable living under the highway. That's not a good environment for them either because they're subject to more 
right? They're closer to the particulate matter, they're closer to the violence, they're closer to everything, closer to the noise. So this is not a place for the unhoused to be. Next slide. So we had the good fortune of partnering with LSU School of Public Health, <clears throat> and they did a study of conditions on, for actually that says one block, but their findings are that if you live within 600 feet of an urban highway, you're going to be severely impacted by the things that go with it. Next slide. So their findings, the health impacts of traffic emissions, not good. You can see it goes through a list of illnesses that no one wants. Um, when we worked with LSU, part of my goal was to make sure that all of the science was, could be understood by the everyman. So we asked a class of fourth graders at a school in the corridor to actually conduct the same scientific test. They did noise readings, they measured emissions, they did everything, and they came up with the same conclusions as LSU students. And you can see that they just gave it back to us in a very kid-like way, where they talk about respiratory illness and described it as <coughs> which is how kids think of being sick when you have something wrong with your chest. Next slide. Um, noise pollution. I talked about measuring the noise under the highway. You can see that hearing loss occurs at 85 decibels. We measured 80 decibels during a relatively quiet time um, under the highway. So you can imagine during rush hour when there are a lot of si sirens, it is truly deafening. You can't hear, you can't talk on the phone, you can't have any kind of conversation if you're walking under the expressway. Next slide. It also keeps you from sleeping. <laughs> and then lead in the soil. Actually, when we started working with LSU, we thought that Katrina wiped away some of the legacy lead in the soil. But about a month ago, we did a field day with kids ranging from first grade to high school, and it even included um, high schoolers at an alternative school. And Dr. Milkey of Tulane University measured the soil in a playground, and it was at dangerously high levels. So he turned to me and said, you've got to fix this. The city has to fix it. I can encourage them, but the city has to fix it. The unfortunate or tragic, if you will, thing that we also discovered in the playground were used hypodermic needles. This is a playground that is directly adjacent to the highway. The needles weren't found by high schoolers. They were found by the first graders who went to sit around the swings and it was just littered with hypodermic needles. That is not a way for kids to enjoy a playground. Lead plus hypodermic needles, that's a, a zone for no one. Next. Uh, I think we have to go forward. So removal for us is an opportunity. And the slide on your right was actually um, an initial poster that was developed for our campaign that talks about the limited life of highways. The life of a highway is about 40 years, and Claiborne reached its time back in 2008. So we're way past needing to get rid of it, and the conditions show the slide at the top on your left is a bit hard to see, but the nuts and bolts are working their way apart from one another. That's not good. That's holding the deck to the columns. So I think of it as the rattling backyard picnic table. One set of nuts and bolts goes and then the whole thing starts to rattle. So this is clearly a sign of age. The slide at the bottom shows that the steel is slowly but surely being revealed and is pervasive. So if you walk anywhere in the Claiborne Corridor, you will see that the steel is being revealed on each of the column beams. Next slide. So again, removal gives us opportunity, and with the removal of the highway, 
particularly in the seventh ward, which is where we can put the most housing, most affordable housing, we have to keep it affordable. If it goes on to the open market, that's it. The investors in New Orleans are dying to get their hands on this land. But you can see we can re-knit the blocks in the grid of the whole community and actually repair it. So I would like to see removal as opportunity, and hopefully you can too, and I will pass the torch to Mark. Amy, Amy, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, you do it with <laughs> such conviction and such heart, and years and years of dedication to your to your work. Oh, okay. Yes, thank um, you. Great. Um, my name is Mark Wooters. I'm an urban planner in New York City, and I'm going to discuss uh, two projects, highway projects, quickly. Um, the first is a big monster highway in New York City called the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And the quick version of the story is that the city wanted to expand the highway two years ago. The win is that we stopped them. Uh, I stopped them uh, working with our community leaders. We got them to shrink a part of the highway, and now we're gonna be on to the next steps. The second highway I'm gonna talk to you about is a highway through a city, small city, that is approved for demolition will be converted into an urban boulevard, and there the issue is there's gonna be new land available. And the big question that we're gonna be working on is, who is that going to benefit? All right, so this one is uh, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway in New York City. It was cut through all sorts of neighborhoods, African American neighborhoods, Latin neighborhoods, Italian working class neighborhoods. It's 10 miles long, carries 157,000 cars per day. It is enormous. And basically just flashed through the city. Next, it's just, and you can see how it was just cut through um, really just indiscriminately through, the, through a vital neighborhood. Next. And this is, uh, ties back to what Amy was saying. This is a map of nitrous oxide emissions along the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So these are, you know, sort of uh, go along with, you know, carbon dioxide and others. This is particularly noxious. Um, and you can see the heightened levels along the path of the highway. Harvard did a study of some of these highways showing elevated rates of asthma, bronchitis, even death. Next. Um, I'm going to focus on this particular portion of the highway, which the city wanted to try and fix. Um, uh, it's known as the triple cantilever. In its day in the 50s, it was a, known as a genius piece of engineering. Um, next. And the reason why it's called the triple cantilever is because they actually had to wrap the highway around a hillside, and it spanned, the highway is on two levels, and then up on top, they actually did something oddly rather nice, which is the Brooklyn Promenade. Next. So on top of it is this beautiful overlook of New York City and the East River. And it actually is a really beautiful park. Everybody comes from all over the world to visit it. What the city decided to do to expand the highway was they were going to demolish this whole park next and turn it into a brand new six lane elevated highway, um, as grand as any of the highways built in the 50s and 60s, um, at a cost of $3 billion. Uh, of course, I was not happy with, with bringing back the dinosaur age, um, nor were our city leaders, and so we fought uh, to stop this and come up with alternative methods. Next. Um, and this is just another snapshot. So this is a view of the Brooklyn Bridge, and as, if you go to New York City, you know as a pedestrian, you can walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. Next. And this is what our Department of Transportation was going to do. They were going to extend the highway over the Brooklyn Bridge and, and destroy a significant piece of our history. Next. Um, these are some of our community rallies. So the way we strategize is we worked at two levels. One is the community started activism as a whole. They started a letter writing campaign. They started pet petitions. And there are Brooklynites all over the world, it turns out, who wrote in. We got like 50,000 signatories. Um, 
and community leaders got in and we started meetings. I worked on the technical side. Next. Um, so what I did was I am an urban planner. I'm not particularly trained in transportation engineering and yet over my th uh, nearly three decades of work, I have learned a lot about transportation engineering and bridge engineering. I re-engineered the entire Department of Transportation's proposal in order to come up with something that didn't do damage. And so, in, in other words, it's kind of like working in partnership with what their needs were. So I looked at logistics, including construction phasing, materials delivery, uh, lane management, so that traffic could, could move while things were done. I looked at demolition strategies, risk management. These things are dangerous in a way to build. Uh, schedules, cost, all those things. Between those two strategies, we won. Next. Uh, and what we are getting is that not only will it not be built, um, but we succeeded in getting a reduction of the number of lanes of the existing highway from three lanes in each direction to two lanes in each direction. And now we're working on getting express bus lanes on some of those lanes. Uh, we are also decking over the highway so that now the neighborhoods that were separated on either side of the highway now have pedestrian and bike connections across the highway. Next. Um, and by using these two strategies, the community strategy and then the technical strategy, what we were able to do was create a table where DOT and the residents were able to meet together at the table and have civilized, rational discussions as best as they could. And, and it really did work. We, enforced it, uh, we created an executive panel of experts. The, the dialogue remained very civil during the whole thing, and everybody gradually came around to the communities and our point of view. Next. Um, just general things about transportation. One way to start getting rid of highways is to start taking the driver load off of highways. What New York City did was they are installing a congestion pricing program. In Lower Manhattan, cars are not going to be able to enter Lower Manhattan unless they pay a toll, all private cars. And those are the cars that are on the highway that I was talking about. So this is going to go into effect probably later this year. Um, and the idea is to force people to say, oh, it's actually cheaper to use mass transit to get to, to, to lower Manhattan rather than their personal automobile. Next. Um, and improving transit. Next. Um, and it's really, the highways are used by these outer boroughs, the outer parts of Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. So now we're into long-term planning. Not only did we succeed in stopping the expansion of the highway, in reducing a small piece of the highway, but now the city has agreed to a long-term study to change the whole thing. This thing is a beast. We're talking about a 10-year study of how we're going to phase it in over time. Um, as we look at that work, we have to recognize that if the BQE becomes better, let's say we turn it into urban boulevards, there will be gentrification along the entire length of that boulevard. And so as we do planning to improve our transportation system, the planning has to start for how to protect people in communities, many of them low income, that live next to this highway to keep them from being displaced because they've been contributing to the city dealing with the hardships of this city for three or four decades, and they need to benefit from the, new, from the new proposals as they come along. Next. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about Syracuse. Syracuse is a small town in the middle, a, a smaller city in the middle of New York State. Um, there is this elevated highway that was built in the 60s. And this one has been approved to be taken down. Next. Uh, and it will be replaced by an at-grade urban boulevard. So this has been signed off. The money is there. This project is going to happen. The demolition will probably start later this year. I'm officially working on the project. Next. Um, and what comes with this project now is new land. 
the new replacement boulevard will probably be smaller in size than the amount of roadway with all the loop-de-loops and ramps um, that Amy was talking about, how much land that takes up. Some of that will be given back. So the orange area on, on that drawing in the left is probably new land. Plus, there are a lot of surface parking lots that are there. And on the map on the right, you'll see all that gray is land that really could be developed much better. Um, so there's a lot of land. And so the question is, what do you do with that land? Next. And of course, so people now have visions of, look at all the new housing we can build. Now that instead of a horrible highway, we have a beautiful boulevard. Look at all the economic development potential that a city could create. Uh, this really could generate jobs, as well as provide low-cost housing, as well as mid-range housing. Um, it could do a lot for the city. But here's the thing that I think is also critically, critically important. Next. This highway was cut through an African-American community, and not just in a small way, in a big way. Um, and when I look at the history of the neighborhood, um, this ward um, was seen as a refuge from discrimination. And it's why so many people really found this place, supported each other, created support systems, was this particular area. Um, and then in the mid-60s, Syracuse engaged in an urban renewal program. And they made the determination to demolish 27 blocks in this particular neighborhood in order to make way for the new expressway and government buildings. Of course, uh, that isn't, you know, it, it, it's, really, um, it, it's really just hard to get your head around, um, frankly. Um, and so we've been working with the community um, really quite a bit in order to talk about, you know, who gets new housing? How do we stabilize when this becomes a brand new neighborhood uh, with the highway gone? How do the existing residents benefit? How do we provide stable housing to make certain that the community doesn't gentrify? And can we do things like community land trusts? or other things so that people could even move back to the neighborhood who were displaced previously. So that's part of our work. Thank you. Next. Great. Well, that is getting set up. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this stellar panel um, that has gone so far. My name is Dr. Reagan Patterson, and I'm currently the Transportation Equity Research Fellow at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation in DC, occupied lands of the Nacostans and the Piscataway Confederacy. Um, and I'm actually an engineer by training. I earned my MSA and PhD recently in environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. I was actually really excited to be back on the West Coast, um, even though briefly. Um, my dissertation research actually focused on the impact of transportation policies on air quality and environmental justice. Um, but I say that while I received academic training in engineering, I came to truly understand the human consequences of transportation-related policies and practices through the work of black women environmental justice organizers fighting for and reimagining a world conducive to livable black futures. And so one such person is Ms. Margaret Gordon, who is the co-founder of the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. She is an amazing community organizer who I had the honor of working with throughout my um, um, graduate school. And so Ms. Margaret helped shape not only my advocacy, but also my doctoral research, even in very unexpected ways, which will be revealed momentarily, as I discuss a project that was only made possible by environmental justice organizing against the Cypress Freeway. Next slide. So these three images show the demolition of West Oakland to build the Cypress Freeway. West Oakland was a red line neighborhood, which has been a theme of where these highways have been placed, um, and one of the few East Bay neighborhoods where black folks could own homes. Construction of the Cypress Freeway led to property demolitions and displaced 600 families. The freeway, which was completed in 1958, bisected West Oakland. 
and freeway construction, including two other um, freeways in West Oakland, along with other urban renewal projects, destroyed over 5,000 housing units and resulted in economic decline in the area. Next slide. So when the Cypress Freeway collapsed during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which was shown on the intro slide, the California Department of Transportation favored a rebuild option on the same alignment. However, unlike urban renewal, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA, provided the community with the opportunity to participate in the decision-making process. And so for Caltrans, this was about replacing a freeway infrastructure link. But for community, this was an opportunity to redress environmental injustice. So community leaders and activists organized the Citizens Emergency Relief Team, or CERT, to oppose reconstruction along the original route. Among its members were Bill Love, whose mother led the fight against urban renewal and was able to actually save some homes in West Oakland, and Paul Cobb, whose grandfather's home and grocery store were demolished for BART. Love's mother and Cobb's father had lost the fight against the Cypress and another freeway, the Grove Shatner, or I-980. When the Cypress fell, CERT identified alternative routes around the perimeter in an industrial area. Um, so you can see the replacement route in that image there. In 1991, Caltrans selected the new alignment. However, this new alignment did impact residents in what's called the Lower Bottoms. I don't have a clicker, but if you see where 7th and 8th Street, that's called the Lower Bottoms of West Oakland. Um, bringing it closer to homes like that of Ms. Margaret, who had recently moved to West Oakland. So residents of the Lower Bottoms filed a discrimination suit under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The case was settled out of court and brought in mitigation measures, including the transformation of the old alignment into a landscape boulevard, later known as Mandela Parkway, which you see in red. And so I share this story because it is through such powerful anecdotes that we reinsert people into these landscapes and as engineers into our work. And so for this study, I investigated um, the air pollution and neighborhood impacts of rerouting the Cypress Freeway and constructing a street level boulevard. And my objectives were to one, quantify the local effects of rerouting on air pollution by comparing two scenarios, um, re, um, putting it right on the old alignment or the reroute, and then two, examining neighborhood socioeconomic and demographic impacts as indicated by indicators of gentrification. And so one thing I do really like about this project and the only reason that it was actually possible is the use of um, community traffic count data because um, as some know, we do count data on highways, but not on local arterials. Next slide. So briefly, and I'll go briefly, results show that rerouting did in fact result in substantial reductions. And so the rebuild in place, that's the residential area of West Oakland compared to that periphery area. And so um, these maps just substantiate that by rerouting the Cypress Freeway, um, high concentrations do shift from that residential area in the middle to around the periphery, providing quantitative support for replacing a freeway with a boulevard to provide air quality benefits. Next slide. Oh. Um, can you click one more time? Click once. Okay, go back. I don't know what happened. Um, we'll just work with it. So it also resulted in some environmental gentrification and displacement of longtime residents, which is important um, to highlight to a Yimby audience. And so environmental gentrification is a term to describe when environmental justice activism actually leads to cleanup, but then that leads to gentrification and displacement of the very residents meant to benefit. And so compared to West Oakland as a whole, there was a larger decline in the percent of residents living in poverty and a sharper decrease in the black population along Mandela Parkway, which may be due to larger increases in the cost of housing. That would have been highlighted for you, but now you just have a lot of numbers to kind of sift through. I apologize uh, for that. Um, but in fact, median home values were lower along the Cypress Freeway than in West Oakland as a whole, but actually significantly higher along the parkway in 2010. And then one thing I will specifically point to is the increase in median gross rent, so the third from the bottom line. And so what you'll see is that the area along Mandela Parkway had smaller increases in median rents, which may be due to the presence of affordable housing. So there is um, a grouping of affordable housing actually along that uh, boulevard. And so this speaks to how preserving affordable housing can actually reduce the displacement of intergenerational residents. Next slide. And so it's the presence or absence of equitable policies and practices that prioritize the needs of existing residents, such as anti-displacement strategies, 
that make the difference and determine equity outcomes of freeway teardown projects. And so today, cities, including Oakland, are grappling with this. And so this is an image of I-980 and some of the overpasses, um, which tore through and segregated West Oakland, which you see on the left, on your left, from downtown, which is on your right. And I-980 was actually on the Congress for the New Urbanism's 2019 list of freeways without features. Next slide. And so this picture shows longtime resident Shirley Foster, whose home, who had to relocate due to the construction of I-980. Her home, as well as 500 others, were in the path of construction. Due to organizing, though, particularly by Connect Oakland, the Oakland-specific plan includes removal. And I do want to emphasize that that is the goal line, removal. And so while the study that I just described focused on a case of rerouting, it is possible to tear down a freeway without replacement, as evident with the nearby Embar Embarcadero Freeway in San Francisco, um, of, which was also torn down after the Loma Prieta earthquake, but only replaced with the Embarcadero. So if you've been to San Francisco and enjoyed your walk along in the Embarcadero, there used to be a double-decker highway there, but it is now gone without replacement. Um, but I look forward to being in a creative space with my fellow panelists to discuss how freeway teardowns can actually redress inequity for longtime residents and how and who gets to imagine this space at this new transportation and housing nexus. Thank you. Thanks, Reagan. That's a great segue into uh, having Sean Dunwoody from Rochester join us, where, uh, as we saw some of those images in the beginning, uh, Rochester has actually removed part of its highway. Um, and Sean uh, well, is going to share a few thoughts, uh, joining us on the screen, about uh, how that pro the project now, uh, in particular the Interloop North removal, can actually address the inequities. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, team. You, you guys are awesome. I, I, I love listening to smart people talk about smart things because it makes me feel dumb. It's beautiful. Um, I, I, you know, and you know, there's a lot that's that's going on and what has happened. So, uh, audience members, I don't have uh, the, there's things that have been going on here, and that's why I'm not there with your lovely faces. Uh, so, I wasn't able to put together a proper slideshow for all of you. So, you're going to have to. Uh, have a Mr. Rogers moment with me, and, and we're going to have to go to the, the the land of imagination. But it's actually real. So, in the in the city of Rochester, New York, in our in our downtown. So I, I use my hands a lot. So you'll you'll see all these things happening uh, as we talk about the infrastructure and creating these highways. What was happened? What happened? What was built in my city was a complete loop, a complete circle around the downtown. Of course, to get people in and out of the city, and not there. Let's buy, let's let's bypass the brown. Uh, to get to the light. And uh, what they did was it actually destroyed the fabric and connectivity and the, the, all the nerve endings that connected people to business, community, uh, shopping, uh, health, all those things were removed. And so those businesses left, the people that were there left, and it left a community to struggle. Um, and it did go through, as Ben mentioned earlier, and as everyone has mentioned earlier, it did go through uh, predominantly uh, brown and black and immigrant community. So as time goes on, it progresses, things begin to change. And uh, we see a steady decline, steady decline in those neighborhoods that have been caught off by uh, our inner loop or what I like to call the moat. So this moat has cut off these arteries to folks. So neighborhoods around the moat begin to decline. That's why sort of currently uh, we're number two in the country for child, uh, uh, children living in poverty. I mean, it's, it's really bad. Um, and so we have this moat that has cut off people. And then we started to see a sort of, a sort of shift that began to happen in the center downtown uh, with offices, buildings being left and evacuated. Uh, you know, the initial uh, 50s white flight, uh, they started to come back, right? People started to come back to the city, like, hey, let's go back and let's live there. We're retired now. We don't have to worry about our school districts. Our kids are grown and gone elsewhere. Um, so they started moving uh, back into the cities. And so we started to see this, this shift in downtowns, as I, I believe we see this in, across the country. But throughout this process, this, is, this has not been an uh, um, um, overnight thing. So for at least the past 20 years, our city has actually been looking at how do we actually remove this moat? How do we take it out? How do we remove it? Um, 
So they've studied, they studied, they look, how do we remove it? And they figured they would do it in sections. So I'll explain to you one section that Ben showed earlier, which is the inner loop east. So they began to remove that portion. They you know, filled it with dirt, there's trucks coming with dirt. Uh, and they had to move quickly, even though they've been planning for 20 years, once they received the, the Tiger funds, uh, they only had a few months really ahead to get their plans and design out. So there wasn't much, there wasn't much uh, community engagement that happened in that process. And so they, they went ahead, they filled the land as Ben showed earlier in the, in the slots. They just sort of just cut it up like a, like a weird I don't know, submarine, I guess, and just said, here's a plot, here's a plot, here's a plot. Uh, you, you developers do whatever you want to do on these plots. Um, and so they did, they built, they developed what they wanted to do. It did create density where there once was a highway. It, it cut down to a, a three lane uh, road, which was a, a six lane road. Uh, it did create housing density. It brought that there, but it is, and it did create community. I can't say it didn't, but what it did instead of removing, when it removed the moat, you know, our sunken highway, whoop, it actually built a wall. Whoop. And so what we have are these non-breaking moments, these larger blocks, uh, which just still were just plots that were put there. Moving forward, my partner, Suzanne Mayer and myself, um, when we heard about the eventual fill of Interloop North. Now I'll have to explain to you that dynamic. So Interloop East had uh, not too many residential areas. Uh, of course they did on the highway. Uh, you know, you always put your undesirables next to a highway, next to something that's traveling. So you had your projects that were next to there. Um, so they can breathe in all the toxic fumes that are coming off these cars as they, as they leave downtown and not concerned with them, but that's a whole other issue. Um, and so you had this, this, it wasn't too much going on as far as single homes, uh, schools or anything else going on in this area. So people felt like, or city officials and individuals felt like they could move this ahead and forward. So when we look at the uh, Northern stretch, you have uh, low uh, density, you have single family homes that are sitting right on that highway. Their backyards are literally in the highway. You move on to um, uh, medium density, uh, then to some high density closer to our water our waterfront, we have two waterfalls in the middle of our city. Um, and so when we heard, my partner and I, when we heard that they were going to fill in this north part, we realized that we have to inter we have to intervene, we have to get loud, we have to do something, we have to speak on behalf of the people. So I'll go back to uh, the region that I'm talking about, uh, the area where, the, where that change began to come. So my partner, Suzanne, lives on the side. Remember I said the downtown began to shift and people started coming in and, and building their condominiums. So they started building these, you know, $400,000 homes, $600,000 condominiums on this side of the inner loop. And on this side of the inner loop, you have people living in, you know, $40,000 homes, um, $55,000 homes. And there's a few thousand feet that are separated these two. So you've got some major disparities going on, social and uh, economic and racial disparities that are happening between these two neighborhoods. And so my partner, Suzanne, is actually from this side of the uh, inner loop. And I myself grew up on this side of the inner loop here. And as we realized this was coming, we were working together on a, on a campaign and we realized we could work together well. And we said, we need, we need to find uh, another mission that is really solid and is really gonna shape uh, how Rochester is, is created and where it becomes. And when we found out about the, the north side getting filled, we realized once again, going back to these two communities, when the initial um, fill of inner loop East happened, there wasn't much community engagement. You have people that are living here. We realize we have to get the community involved. Um, and so we try to go to our, our city officials, the design folks were saying, hey, you've got to listen to communities. They're like, yeah, we're going to have some meetings. We're going to have some stuff. We're going to do the thing. But those things never really materialized. And so we said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to bring these two people together physically and actually talk things over and design this neighborhood. We, re we realize there's strength in numbers. Let's bring them together. So initially we met with uh, one side of the inner loop, this side, and uh, we said, hey, the inner loop is, is gonna get filled, it's coming. And uh, their response was, you know, well, you know, how am I ever gonna make it to the airport to catch my flights on time? And, uh, you know, all these other things. And we thought initially that may be cold for, you know, we don't want these people closer to us. We said, okay, we'll accept that. We go to other side, have a meeting over here, and they say to us, you know what, uh, the idea of the interloop fill, 
that's terrible. There's no way we're going to be able to get to the malls or no way we're going to get anywhere. We don't want it either. So we told both groups, well, you've come to a consensus that you think it's terrible. So let's talk this out and really figure out what we can do. And we were able to get these residents together. Uh, we, we decided we needed to be the buffer between uh, the city and these residents and help educate all of the residents on both sides of that interloop as to what is happening and what their play and part is that's going to happen. Because in most cases, when you have these these uh, these government projects and things are going to happen, everyone walks into the room, you know, with your po they got the post-it notes, maybe some stale, you know, pizza on the table or something like that. And everyone walks into the room and they're complaining about what they don't want, what they don't want. And what we wanted to do was be able to shape and say, here's what we want and here's how we know how to get it. And here's what we work to do to, uh, to create. Um, and so we were able to do that, to bring these folks together to decide what they want their neighborhood to look like. They wanted the return back to the grid, back to the original 16th Ward that was there. They figured out strategies of, of where to produce areas of commerce, figuring out how to design and create a, a grid pattern that brings back the homes in the neighborhood. And so we started to see that, that people wanted to listen. This, this, this is how these things go. I, I can only speak in my region or my area. So we have the process, the process is you know yes we're, we're doing engagement we're meeting with folks we're knocking on doors and in most cases they're not really doing that as you hear from everyone on, on these panels it becomes from you know community root organizations that have to come up and say you know what uh, officials you're actually not doing that so there's the process and once that process is created they create the plan and once that plan is in place they have the way to implement so they're going to implement the plan from the process. And if they can have as little, as much input as they possibly can in this process, the plan will go just as planned when they implement. So we realized we needed to shake that up and break that up. So we started to infuse ourselves in the community in that process. How do we shape the process and how do we change that? And so to make a, a long story short, cause I can go on talking and rambling forever. And I know you don't wanna see my hands flailing all over the place. Like there's a fire behind me, but uh, to make a long story short, what we were able to do was affect the process. We changed the process. And so people listened to these communities and we actually created a plan for that community, which is now part of the process. We actually created and worked with our, our residents, uh, with architects to create a reconnection street grid, street grid. Also, we've been working to figure out how do we do affordable housing, uh, not just stacked uh, apartments, but how do we actually go back to building homes, a small stretch within the community. Also, how do we, we've, we've got this interloop. Remember I told you there's this side, they've got their, their houses over here and then there's this side. This side is feeling neglected. They're saying, all right, if you're gonna fill this in, you got to take care of all these 137 vacant lots that you haven't tended to. And so now in the process, in the plan coming up is to figure out how do we do an infill as well. And we don't gentrify the folks that are already there. I mean, there are folks in this community who are still living, who live in this community prior to the interloop when it was all connected when the interloop was there and when it was being built. So what they would do was climb inside and swim because it was basically a huge swimming pool. Uh, and on their way to school, and parents are the things they jump in and swim when it flooded from the rain. Um, so it's, it's really about what we've been able to been trying to do is, is pull the ears of, of government officials, city officials, designers, and actually uplift those communities together because when they're together, they can actually shape and create that change. And we've actually seen those efforts going forward. And we have actually secured the funds to uh, fill in. Our, our, our governor, she announced uh, yesterday that she has earmarked the $100 million that it requires to fill in and to develop uh, Interloop North. So it's going to happen. So now it's the fast track of design phase, but we're also stating to them, we want to, community has to be part of this process. We've also stated when they put out their RFPs, community has to be part of that process to help you write and create that RFP because you have to realize that when you when you remove these families, these businesses, there's their souls attached to that. There, there are lives attached to what has been done. And we have to look forward and think, how do we how do we build in some sort of reparations? How do we build in connectivity? How do we build in to restabilize those neighborhoods that are there and honoring those that we actually took the hell out of there? Uh, and I think the city's understanding it's a very delicate subject. It's not as easy as it was initially. We fill it, 
and people will come. No, there's people already here, brother. You didn't discover this land. There was people already here. So you have to be considerate and think about that and understanding that in your plan. So I hope I have made some sort of sense in all my hand dancing. So I'm going to turn it back over to the rest of the panel as we discuss, I don't know, whatever we discuss. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. That was great. Uh, so obviously we could talk about this all day, and we have, uh, and we had a, a number of uh, great discussion questions planned, but uh, time is of the essence. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is I want to propose one question to our panel here, because I think Sean brought it up at the end, and then uh, if you all can answer maybe in you know, a minute or so, uh, and then we can get to some audience questions, but I think you know, the big point to be made here is the concept of, of justice, right? Doing something that is reparative for the people who have been affected by highway building um, is really key to reconnecting communities projects. Uh, so how does dismantling a highway get there? I think you started to get to this, Sean, about the process and, and linking people in. Um, you know, what, what does the vision for a reparative project in any of, of these four instances actually look like? What's the end goal we're aiming for here? Um, well, I'll start. I'll start. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, for Claiborne and the Seventh Ward, the reparative process has to be removal, period. And then including the community in the vision, which we're starting to do now um, as part of the alliance. And fortunately, we have the support of Congressman Troy Carter um, to move forward with the creation of a community uh, vision. But New Orleans is a really small city and the highway is very constrained. There's no room to expand it. There's, we can't even repair it comfortably, which we don't want repair. So the restorative process for us is removal, making sure that people who live there can stay there, make sure that people who have lived there have a way to come back if they so choose, and one thing that we are working on now is partnering with the city because we can't do this without the city as a participant. So as a community, we're going to be able to, we're going to craft a, a vision and look at the process as Sean and his partner Suzanne did and then actually encourage the city to come along with us. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that our political leaders are on board. But at our most recent community meeting, we had um, Congressman Carter, Representative Royce Duplessis, who is the state representative for the district, and then one city councilman. And that is a huge deal for New Orleans because up until last week, no one from the city would even talk about Claiborne, not even in terms of repair. Um, so we are crafting that vision as we speak, literally. I'm kind of curious, Reagan, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, because you were in the California angle, right, and thinking about bills like AB uh, 1778 and like Santa Monica's uh, right to return program. Where do, you, where do you see those fitting into this overall uh, world of, of reconnecting communities? Um. So thank you for that question. With these bills, they're trying to start to actually get at reparations. And so if any of you attended the previous talk on freeways, um, Alex discussed 17, AB 1778 in more detail, which says no more freeway expansions in environmental justice communities. And so right, that's a do no harm principle, right? Do no further harm principle, really. And so that is one aspect of getting at justice and um, restorative justice, reparative justice, transformative justice, um, any of those terms that you might get at. The return home program in Santa Monica is an idea for reparations, but also problematic in the sense that it allows people to fast track the um, affordable housing application process. And so that's giving people access to rental properties. But when you take people's homes, I don't want your apartment. I want my home, I want my business, I want the generational wealth that was lost, so I want a check. I don't want a rental property. And so, 
um, when we're talking about reparations and we're talking about justice, it's whose visions are leading these conversations because you have a, a, a I, um, well-intentioned program with what's happening in Santa Monica, but that's not really what reparations is if I'm a person whose home was literally destroyed for a highway. And so whose voices are at that table? And so when you look at environmental justice, self-determination is one of the fundamental um, principles of environmental justice. And so as Bernice King tweeted, it's not about who's at the table, but who owns the table. And so we need a fundamental shift in how we do this and how, and so being part of the process is an interim step, but who controls that process is really what justice is about and whose voices are not just at the table, but who has ownership in the decision making at that table. Sean or Mark, any, any thoughts on either of those? Thinking I, about I, I agree with what Reagan said there. That's that's actually key. You know, that's the, the first step is, is stepping in and, and disrupting that process. And then you've got it, you've got to hold those those folks uh, to the table. You gotta hold those folks at the table to some account. They gotta be accountable, uh, which is important. You've got to be able to make sure that they're going to follow through and you have to you, you, you gotta for sometimes you gotta force their hand. I've been in uh, many of these, you know. You know, meetings, as, as Reagan said, with people at the table making decisions, but you're making decisions and you haven't even been in the damn neighborhood. Why don't you come down and walk a minute, okay? And before you make any decision and see what is going on to actually understand the, what the culture is, what the life is, is going on here. Don't make a decision behind your desk or, or in, in a closed room. This decision is made by the people. And so this is where we continue to push and say, you, you have to. You have to include the people. We've actually set within, once again, our process and plan, we've set, we put in a, a racial equity matrix. So anything that goes through that has to be designed or thought upon, we've got to, we've got to figure out, are we being equitable? Are we really considering culture? Are we considering community? What are we really looking at? I mean, it goes a lot deeper than that, but you really have to be thinking about this consciously um, because the effects of things, it hurt people, it's, it, it, they're scars, they're scars. And those don't go away easily, and so uh, it's not going to—it's not going to be a, a saving grace. But we can actually create something so that generations can benefit from, as Reagan said, you know, the, the generational wealth that was literally cut off uh, to these communities needs to be restored. And uh, you know, uh, one of the things when they talked about uh, uh, when Mark was talking about Syracuse, you know, and they had the, the, their uh, bipartisan committee, you know, deciding on this this twenty billion dollars that was supposed to go out, and then it got cut to one billion dollars. I'm like, what the hell is it? Why did it get cut to one billion dollars? That's ridiculous. Then we look at the bipartisan committee. I have to tell you, none of those people look by like me, like they ain't got a cousin Tyrone nowhere in their family. Uh, so I was like, yeah, once again, it goes back to what Reagan said. These are the people making the decisions. So we always have to uh, come back at them and say, hey, no, 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 that's not happening. So um, I agree with what everyone's saying here on the panel. There are steps and stages to make things happen, but it can be done. Um, yeah, I, I really agree with all of that. It's, it's about reframing the table so that the people who are part of the community, they're all at the table, who owns that table. And Sean's point in particular about, every, about spending time with the community, involving the community in those decisions. And, and you know, we, it was interesting in the prior session, we had this whole discussion about who makes decisions at the local level or at the federal level for housing was a really interesting point. This is really a case for being at the local level, just how much importance it is to really hear from people, how these highways and demolition programs impacted people. I think in, in addition to a pathway for justice in Syracuse for tearing down the highway, which is already gonna happen, is now we have all this land. And because it's right next to downtown, there is an opportunity for Syracuse to generate economic growth from that land as well as housing. And so there's an opportunity to create more housing. There may be land that we may be able to create programs like community land trusts that have affordable home ownership that allow for generational wealth uh, for, uh, for people who may want to come back to the community who are displaced. But there also is potential for job growth in the downtown. And how do we connect people in the community to participate in that economic growth in an equitable fashion. And I think what we're hearing from that city government sounds all very positive in construction and supporting that vision. 
Can I just oh, make go ahead. one yeah. point, real quick point? Um, I agree that when you lose generational wealth, an apartment isn't a, an adequate solution. Um, but when we talk about things like reparations, we always think about people who were shoved out and lost their property. You also have to think about those of us who have stayed, because I've lost generational wealth too. So if my house were in uptown New Orleans, it would be worth probably four times what it is now, worth now. So there's the disparity, that we, we were able to stick it out because my family made a decision to do it, but we also lost wealth because we decided to stay. So you have to include not only people who were put out, but also people who stayed and continued to lose. Uh, so I think we probably have time for maybe one audience question, but I know our panelists uh, will be happy to answer afterwards during lunch hour too. Um, are there any questions out there uh, in the audience? Yeah, up front here. And if you wouldn't mind, you might just speaking into the microphone so Sean can hear you as well. Is it on? Yeah. Hi. Um, Ivy O'Neill. I'm here in Portland. And just listening to this, transportation is a new one for me. I come from an architecture and planning and education policy background. So transportation is a new one. And that role of federal money in all of this. So we're talking about kind of this local recapturing of what happened with federal money originally. You're talking about 90% of the, of the building occurred with federal money originally to build these highways. What's the role of federal money in trying to dismantle or trying to make better what was done? So panelists, there may be 30 seconds or less. I mean, Syracuse is, fun Syracuse is funded to have their highway torn down. That funding does come from the federal government program um, through a couple of programs. It goes to the state, and then the state is allocating uh, the money, uh, hopefully to Sean's project as well, who's also in New York State as well as mm -hmm. to Syracuse. Yep. And broadly, yep, so, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, just broadly, right now, the reconnecting communities is federal funding to support yes. this work. Um, it's insufficient funding, but it is a step and the first time that the federal government is doing this. And so there is now um, this federal program that is supporting this. But in, in a place like New Orleans, um, the federal funding, even though it is minuscule compared to what it was, um, we can still use that to push the project forward. So even though we may not uh, be able to do complete removal now, there are still steps that we can take toward removal using those federal dollars, and we intend to take advantage of it. Now, it's absolutely a great question, particularly as uh, the infrastructure bill piles hundreds of million dollars back into highway expansion uh, or highway possible highway construction. So it's, it's uh, reconnecting communities is certainly a start and uh, a seed to build on, um, but there's more work to be done. So I realize that we have run over time, uh, but let's take a moment to thank our great panelists. I'm sure they'd be happy to chat more afterwards, and thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And a shameless plug, we do have a freeway fighting happy hour this evening at 6.30 in the asylum uh, food cart across the river. Um, so please join us if you want to continue this conversation I, I, too. Can I, can I just say something really quick, Ben? Uh, just, just to what the young lady talked about. Yes, things can be, can be done and it's happening. Uh, ours is slated to be completed by 2027. So we're on it. <laughs> yeah, pay attention to Rochester. Good things happening there. <laughs> Thank you all.